Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Barbara Mumby Huerta, and I am the Vice President of Programs and Partnerships here at the Native Arts and Cultural's Cultural Foundation. Um, we're so excited to have three incredible artists, plus an equally incredible moderator here today to share some um, works that are taking place across the nation with our Native artists. Uh, first, I'd like to remind you that we are um, closed captioning is available in Zoom and on Facebook. And um, I'd like to share just a little bit about Native Arts and Cultures Foundation. But first, I myself come from the Powhatan Confederacy, which is located on the eastern um, seaboard of the United States, specifically the Pamunkey, Mattaponi, and Padawomac people as well as from my paternal line, the Concow and Spanish from Northern California. And I'm very honored to be a part of the Native Arts and Cultures uh, team. We are currently located in, well, we are located in Portland. Um, we've been in operations for about 12 years. We've uh, proud to say that we've uh, funded about $13 million of arts work throughout the nation through that 12 year history. And those awards have gone to over 538 artists um, that rep or 538 awards that represent about 338 artists through 34 states. And that number just keeps growing. Um, we also are at a very um, incredible uh, transition for our organization. Uh, we've gone from a, a national organization that funds artists throughout the nation to one that is also now rooted in the Portland metro area. We were rematriated a building um, this past year. And uh, so you'll hear more to come about the new Center for Native Arts and Cultures um, that will be, um, we're currently working on programming that will begin this coming spring and we'll go through a pretty major renovation and retrofit so that we will reopen in 2025 and off offer a place for artists from around the nation to come and and uh, create work and share work with the broader community. So we're very excited about that. But um, as such, it's really important that we acknowledge that we are guests here in this territory. Um, the Petro, uh, Portland metropolitan area rests on the traditional village sites, the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia and Willamette rivers. And so today, Portland's diverse and vibrant Native communities are over 60,000 strong, and they descend from more than 350 tribes, both local and throughout the nation. Uh, we take this opportunity to offer respectful recognition to the Native communities in our region today and to those who have stewarded this, stewarded this land throughout those generations. Um, since our activities are also shared digitally, um, Today, uh, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technologies, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We're using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. So I invite you to join me in acknowledging all this as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. So without further ado, um, I'd like to hand the mic over to Teokasen, who is going to share with us um, an opening remarks and welcome today so that we can get into the program. So again, thank you for joining us. Um, it's very exciting to be here with all of you. And Teokasen, thank you for joining us and uh, sharing with us today. Thank you, Barbara. I'm just going to tag off of you what you said, you know, and uh, basically, how many takapi, yellow. Uh, thank you for joining us here, and it's good that we all give heart to this and uh, that we celebrate this life that we're with today. And, you know, the presenters here, um, I am from the 216 class, I guess you would say, of NACF. Um, and I want to just acknowledge, as you did, Barbara, the lands that you are uh, located on. But I also want to acknowledge the earth, that we are with the earth and learning how to live with the earth. And that's part of our, our obligation, not our right. It's our obligation to learn how to live with the earth because of all the, all the things that she needs now is the attention that I, I would think that indigenous peoples have always been giving 
but now even so, so uh, we can fo sharpen that focus. Um, and part of this panel, I think through art, through music, through collaboration with each other as different nations with the earth, uh, that we can do that. And I'd like to invite the earth in, if you can go to that place. The, the earth is everywhere, but now we are conscious that we need to invite the earth in to give us this. Um, and uh, there's, there's things that I've done uh, before this to make sure that these messages are much bigger coming from the earth and that we are always thinking from her. And so I went to put some tobacco down in the directions that I am taught. And I noticed there were no birds. And when I finished, all these birds showed up. So this is the acknowledgement, I think, that we have to include and not just the human aspect of us only, right? Because it is, after all, Midakwe Oyasi, all is in relationship to all relationship. So I'd like to give it that, Christopher, and it's all yours. Thank you for asking me to step in and begin all this, this great wondering that we're going to be doing here. Thank you. Mahalo to Yokasan. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. It's a real pleasure to be here with you all today. My name is Christopher Morgan. My pronouns are he, his, him. I'm a native Hawaiian choreographer, performer, and arts administrator, and recently became the director of the Center for Native Arts and Culture, which Barbara was just talking about. Currently, I'm working remotely in the Washington, D.C. area. These are the unceded lands of the Nakanchtank, Piscataway, Pamunkey, Powhatan peoples, amongst so many others, um, not too far from where Barbara's people are from, actually. So it's nice to have that connection across distance, space, and time. Diokas, and thanks for really summoning so many places in. It's wonderful to imagine, as I see in the chat, everyone tuning in from all over, um, where we all are and how we're connected. And I'm reminded of the words of the Clinkett writer, Ernestine Hayes. At that 2016 gathering of fellows where I first met Teokasen, she really reminded us all that as we navigate the residue of colonization, that in fact, all of the wonders we see around us would have happened regardless of colonization. It would just be embedded with the values that we as native and indigenous people have. And I look forward to the ways that we as an artist community can continue to infuse those values and elevate them through folks like we have today in this conversation who are doing such excellent work. Um, and it's a real pleasure to be in community with them. Before I start in on our introductions, just a little bit of housekeeping. So um, as we go through this webinar, we're going to first get introduced to each of the artists a couple of ways, and um, I'll share more with you as we go. A reminder that closed captioning is available, and you probably saw that in the chat. There are some um, advices there how to access that if it helps your accessibility for today's conversation. Also in the chat, it was mentioned already that we won't really be utilizing a question and answer from the audience, but hopefully the meaningful discussion we engage in will really provoke some great conversation amongst the artists and thoughts for you. Um, please be thoughtful and mindful as you add to the chat. This is a community founded on respect. And so we, uh, we hope that that can be present in how we discuss with one another in the chat. We'll be doing a little poll um, a little later on in this process. And it's a great way for the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation to know who's showing up to these conversations and how we can continue to serve your interests and needs. And that also relates to the post-event survey that we'll have following this webinar. So please engage with us. We are really grateful to have you tuning in today. It's a wonderful turnout. And we look forward to how we can continue both in this dialogue and in future dialogues supporting your interests. So as we were preparing for today's session, artists, Native artists as leaders, I was thinking a lot about these artists, some of whom I've gotten to know personally, but all of whom I know by reputation. And I realized, you know, in this day and age, we often kind of step into these spaces, reading biographies on people and knowing a bit about them. So while I encourage each of our guests to share some of that biographical information as is useful to you and interesting to you, I also had a couple of questions that I prepared them with that I thought might be a, a different insight in. And to those of you um, on the webinar today, I want to recognize that some of these can come with a little bit of, um, you know, 
different perspectives and, and may bring up different things for each of us. So I acknowledge that. And I also think that's part of what could be interesting, useful, meaningful, is the totality of these questions um, really bringing forth all of the complexities of our identities. So the questions that I prepped these folks with were, I'm curious where their mothers were born and where they call home. And if they could tell me a little bit about culture and family life at their home. Again, I really acknowledge the complexities of these questions, but it might help get us um, beyond some of the biographical information that I also hope we glean from them. So with that, I'll remind you of those questions as we go. But Lonnie, would you mind starting off with us in your introduction? And those questions can just be a background to you. Who's your mother, uh, sorry, where is your mother from? Where do you call home? Tell me about your culture and family life there. I'm from uh, Klukwan, Alaska. My mother was born uh, just down uh, river from Klukwan in uh, Haines, or what we call, uh, I'm drawing a blank now, but uh, Jones Point is where she was born. My family had a house there and it's at the mouth of the Chilkat River. And uh, I have this picture of me wearing my regalia because it shows who I am and where I'm from. You see the eagle uh, headdress there and that shows I'm Kogwan Tan, eagle. And then the uh, tunic, you see my wolf crest figure in the uh, center of my uh, chest there. That's to show I'm from the wolf house. I'm an eagle, I'm a Kaguantan, I'm from the wolf house. And then the robe that I'm wearing, and I'm, I'm wearing an abbreviated version of it now, is the Chilkat River robe. That shows um, that I'm Jifkat Kwan. I am from the Chilkat people. And uh, I live, if you could, I'll just turn my... Um, Thing around so you can see. That's the Chilkat River that uh, is right out my back door there. So, um, and the reason uh, we wear that regalia, it's like uh, when you send uh, athletes to the Olympic Games and they wear the American flag, this shows who we are where we're from. And uh, the Chilkat River is so much a part of who I am. You know, people always ask when you first meet them, where are you from? Because where you're from imprints your personality. It leaves an indelible mark on who you are. And that's, uh, that's who I am. I'm Jifkat Kwan. And uh, you can go to the next slide, you know. This is the uh, Klukwan village. It's a fairly recent photo. Klukwan is in Southeast Alaska. I don't know if you can see the little red dot in the map there. In the more Northern part of Southeast Alaska and situated on the Chilkat River. And uh, my house is more towards the, the left side of the spectrum there. Um, you see the big beige house two-story house and my house is um, one, uh, one house away from that. And it's a beige house too, but it doesn't stand out as much. It's a little darker. Um, Klukwan is actually two words in Tlingit. It means eternal village. And here's this uh, Tluk and On. Tluk is ancient or eternal and On can mean land or it can mean village. Okay, next slide. Uh, just a little bit of demographics of the, the village that I live in here, mostly Native people. It's tribally governed. Um, we have about 2,000 acres. Our traditional land base was the 2.6 million acres, and it extended into Canada as well. That's just down the main street of the village. Next slide. And just a little bit of an environment. Klukwan is located on the confluence of three rivers, the Chilkat, the Klahini, and Sirku. And we're in the heart of the Chilkat Bald Eagle Preserve. And so just get a, a, a clue here of what uh, 
what I see on a daily basis and uh, how it's affected my artwork. Next. Family, you know, none of us stand alone and we stand on the shoulders of all those who've come before us and those who are with us now. And it's um, kind of sad to see, you know, some of these people who have already passed on, but uh, they have given me strength and given me wisdom. And, you know, I didn't know my great, great grandmother on the top left, but she's the one I'm named after. And I believe that Weaving was etched in my DNA because of my ancestors who wove before me. And um, that's my great grandfather next to her. And then in the middle on the top, that's my great grandmother, Akla or Mary Willard. She was a very prolific weaver. And then my grandfather wearing a Chilkat robe standing by the door. And then my uncle, and my oldest brother Ralph on the top right, um, my uncle Richard, and my brother Ralph, yeah. And then bottom left is my uncle Ed and my uncle Albert. And uh, my uncle Ed is still alive, but my uncle Albert passed away and uh, some years ago, I think 2003. And he was the fisherman that provided for our family. My brother Jack is still alive in the uh, full regalia there with the dance paddle. And he's a very uh, active performer, storyteller and dancer. And my brother, Fred, who always, I always called on him to help with our fish camps. And he was quite the fisherman too, much in the tradition of our uncle Albert. And then on the far right, my sister Kimberly and I at the grand opening of our heritage center. And so, yeah, I. I always uh, speak of we because in our culture we're we never think of ourselves as a single person, a single individual. We we think of a, ourselves as part of a family, part of a clan, part of a community, part of a nation. So uh, I think it's important to show some of my family. That's not a complete picture. I have nine brothers and uh, two sisters and. I don't even have a picture of my parents here, so, but you get the idea. <laughs> okay, next. Um, I don't know if this is part of, uh, I guess I want to share about our culture. We are, like uh, Toixin said, you know, we are people of the earth. And in fact, in our culture, we have a saying, Anyek uh, Usani, noble people of the earth. Um, and uh, because in this, this phrase here that we're seeing, it means our life is close by our food. And you can see the different things that we gather throughout the season. The top left is uh, red ribbon seaweed. And then hooligan, a little smell like fish. And then summertime, we spend a lot of time working on salmon. And then in uh, late summer, we start picking our berries. And you can see um, all the hands in that picture where we're harvesting the berries. And that's something that we never do alone when we're um, working on fish, when we're gathering seaweed, when we're picking berries. We're with other family members. And when you're working on food together, you tell stories, you tell jokes, you laugh, you know, and it just binds you together in a cohesive group. So, um, and that's, that's our culture. We live close to the land, we depend on it, and we, um, we respect it. There's there's ways that we treat our food out of respect. Like for this salmon, we have to, we have to hang our sam salmon when we first cut it, hang it so it's still facing upriver, parallel to the river, out of respect for that salmon who was spawning. And uh, 
Yeah, and we don't throw fish waste in the garbage. We always throw that waste back into the river and use, you know, we don't waste. And, you know, gardening, um, it's more bear, different kind of berries. That's el red elderberry and high bush cranberry. And then moose harvest or people get a uh, mountain goat too. Okay, that's, that's who we are. That's how we live. Lonnie, this was such a beautiful beginning of an introduction to you. And I say beginning because I know there's so much more to learn. You know, when I think of this title, Artists as Leaders, what you were just sharing about making sure that we don't waste things and return them to their source. I'll, I'll use that um, adapted terminology, like the, the parts that aren't eaten of the fish go back to the, the river from where they were fished from. I think that's a place where Native and Indigenous artists have so much potential for leadership is to steward the world into a more to use Western terminology, ecological, environmental way. Yeah. Um, it's so clear in, in your ways. And thank you for sharing your community with us um, and even helping us cite it on the map for those of us that aren't as familiar with that very upper Northwest part of, <laughs> um, of Turtle Island. Really, really helpful. Jamaica, I'm going to um, ask you to introduce yourself next. And again, just some questions if you are interested in them. Um, where was your mother born? Where do you call home? And tell us about the culture there. Mahalo. Um, o ma'alo lani nui ke kāne, o lono kau maka i kawahine, no pula wa ahāna o i o i mai kalani ke kāne, o i mai kalani ke kāne o ki koko kalani i kawahine, no pula wa ahāna i o pa'aulu hi kahino lani ke kāne, o pa'aulu hi kahino lani ke kāne o pipi i vai vai ole kawahine, no pula wa ahāna i o Charles Moses kamakuriva ole o zario he kamakuriva ole o kamemehe kāne, o Charles Moses kamakuriva ole o kamemehe kāne, o Daisy Kelly i ai awa awa he wahine, no pula wa ahāna i o Eliza Lea loha kamakuivo ole hewahine. O Eliza lea loha kamakuivo ole kawahine. O Emil Montero ozoro hekane. No pulau aha na ia o Elroy Thomas lea loha ozoro hekane. O Elroy Thomas lea loha ozoro hekane. O Clara kuule kawahine. No pulau aha na ia o Jonathan ke kamakuivo ole ozoro hekane. O Jonathan ke kamakuivo ole ozoro hekane. O Mary Carol Dunn kawahine. No pulau aha na ia o Jamaica heoli mali kalani ozoro hekane. O Jamaica, Heoli Mali Kalani Ozario Hevahine, O Malia Halaman Hevahine, No Pula wa Aha no Ia, O Kale Wahi A Ahuli Ho, Kala Iku, O Kekua Mauna Ozario Hevahine, Aloha Mai Kako. Um, are you folks able to hear me? All right. Ruben, I can hear you fine. I know some people might have been having trouble, but it's okay on my end. Okay. okay. Ruben, I, hope, I hope it gets better. Um, my name is Jamaica Heoli Malia Kalani Osorio. Um, I am a Native Hawaiian born and raised on the island of Oahu. Uh, these are the people I come from. Um, these are just some of the names of my kupuna, of my elders, of my ancestors. Um, Charles Moses, Kamakuivo Ole Okamemeha, his Wahine, Daisy, Kelly, Ai Ava Ava. They lived, loved, had children um, on the island of Hawaii which is, of course, in the great middle of the Grand Pacific Ocean, Oceania. Um, these are my father's siblings. This is my father here, my grandfather. Um, many, but certainly not all of my, what, you know, what the Haole call our first cousins uh, who, who come from this line of, of Osorios. And these are my siblings and my, my beloved Malia. Um, I wanted to share them first today in kind of answering this question, um, rather than just answering where my mother comes from. My mother uh, is a wonderful um, wahine. She's uh, a white settler born and raised in uh, Detroit, Michigan, in Anishinaabe territory. Um, but, but my cultural practice really comes from this place, from Oceania, um, and specifically from Hawaii. Um, and, and rather than just speaking to like, the great and grand and expansive cultural practices of my people because um, because those stories need to be told in their totality from the great numbers of us. So I'll just share a little bit about my ohana. I was raised um, in a family that was surrounded by music, um, by art, by the stories of this landscape. This is the island my father was born on. 
Um, he grew up here in Hilo, uh, but my family comes from all around this Haumakua coast, which means my family was raised in the sacred shade, malu, and protection of Mauna Awakea. Uh, Mauna Awakea is the tallest mountain, the highest peak in the Pacific, and the largest mountain in the world when measured from its base. Um, and so to one of the final questions we were asked to consider was, um, you know, thinking back to our youth, what was a moment that we became aware of the power of politics and the potential as an artist and activist? And I'll probably address this a little more later when we talk about uh, lineage um, and political and cultural and uh, intellectual lineage. Um, and this certainly wasn't the first time, these pictures don't represent the first time that I really became aware of the power of our people but it represents one of the most recent times. And in 2019, many of us stood in sacred protection of our Mauna. Um, and it was a time where we recommitted to our cultural practices. We recommitted to our stories, to our mo'olelo, to our mele, and we recommitted to ourselves as kanaka, as people who will protect the land, um, protect the water. Um, and that reconnected us to our families. Um, and brought us new comrades and brought us new strength and new manna. But most of all, um, for me, it reconnected me back to this Aina, this landscape, this Mauna that many of us have been strategically estranged from. And so when I think about home, um, when I think about culture and family life, when I think about um, trying to find ourselves, build ourselves a more livable, generative future, I think about the, the very important intimate acts of reconnection, um, seeing family in a new way, um, developing comrades in a new place, uh, but most importantly, reconnecting with the land of our ancestors. Um, and everything about that is, is political, everything about that is creative, Everything about that is, I think, bringing us back closer to the people our elders and our ancestors intended us to be and taught us to be. So um, by that, you know, a few other things you might want to know about me. I am some kind of an artist. I am a poet, a writer, a storyteller. Um, I am a water protector and a land protector, a kia'i of both Mauna Awakea and all of Hawaii, but I'm also a protector of my people. Um, and Aloha Aina, someone who loves fiercely the land and loves others who love the land. Um, and I am a professor of Native Hawaiian and Indigenous politics. And those are all the kinds of identities that are constantly uh, colliding and collapsing into one another to make uh, me the person who's in front of you today. So um, I, will, I will stop there and, and hand off uh, back to Christopher. Mahalo, Jamaica. Um, you and the, all the Hawaiians in the chat will appreciate this. Your mo'uku Hau gave me chicken skin. <laughs> so thank you for taking us in to the beginnings of the insight into your work. It's, um, you know, for all the Native folks that are on this call, I don't have to tell us, but anyone else who might not be of these traditions, it's really staggering to think about the shift in land that Lonnie pointed out, the millions of acres down to 2000, as I remember off the top of my head, the strategic separation from Mauna Wakea that um, Jamaica was just referencing. And I think it's such a critical part of this work. This reconnection was a word Jamaica used. So mahalo to both of you for that beginning, getting to know you and your work. Tioka san you're next. Please introduce yourself to our community gathered here today. All right. Well, let me go with this. Um, and um, yeah, this is, I'll go with anything here that goes up. Uh, first of all, I'll introduce myself as Teokasi Chatanzi Wiki Pahami Chaji Oyate Tokahe Wichake Tashunke Wanaki. Basically, four names um, coming from a family of five excuse me, nine, five brothers, um, nine total, and uh, all in the diaspora, diaspora of life and what, what happened when I was born back where out of a log cabin 
along the Missouri River Basin, as they call it, mini Soche in our language, um, is th what happened was there was no cars when there was born. And in that area, um, everybody used horse and buggy. And this is kind of like wild. It's like it's a movie. Um, there was no telephone. We didn't have running water or power. And it's really existed in the middle of, of geographical center of the United States. And my older brother and was home with my mother, who was pregnant with me, and my grandmother and my grandfather and my father were out on a, on a hunt on horseback. And the public health service hospital was three miles away. And at that time, it was illegal to practice our culture, speaker language, all of these ideas that we think we have freedom with now. Um, so, but then my mother didn't want not, did not want me to be born illegally because then she would either I'd end up be taken away or she'd have to be punished somehow or the family would. And so she, her water broke and she had waddled three miles to that hospital just to make sure that I was born legally. And um, so I got there. My dad showed up um, out of breath. Uh, probably the horse was laying down someplace too, maybe very tired. Um, the, the, the birthing nurse, who is Marcella LeBeau, who recently passed away, was 101 years old. Uh, she passed away. She was the first to hold me during that time. And if you understand who Marcella LeBeau is, she is an, an, an old matriarch. From those times, she served time in World War II as a young woman and brought, as she returned to the reservation, brought me forth and was the first, first to hold me. So that I hold that honor within me. Um, I am from the Minikoju Itazip Chola Lakota people. And um, my mother is still alive. We, she speaks Lakota, the old Lakota, fluently. Um, not, I'd say that because it's a non dictionary. Lakota. Um, and she has given me some insight as to where I come from, supported everything. I, I entered boarding school and day school um, off and on years, but with me, I, my father left, um, basically journeyed on at, at when I was four. So I grew up without that father. And we Basically, the, the relative relationships that we have with relatives, that was our group. And I like the way Lonnie said it, that we are never alone. And this is how we supported each other um, and grew up organically before it was cool. We had gardens everywhere. And, you know, that left us. And then so boarding school came along and, you know, we got through that, right? Mechanically, we got through it. Um, the education came and I began to study other cultures, other societies. And um, what I came away with is that and when Pythagoras, and this is where I go, because I've been all over the world, Pythagoras basically said that um, music, uh, a matter is only matter is only is only music solidified. And again, I go back to another artist, Van Gogh, who said something like um, when he was asked, what do you paint? And he said, sunlight. So when you're thinking about what, what draws our energy, it's more of nature. So I've been going with that while learning the mistakes of how to live in a society that in, uh, and from a society, uh, a culture coming into a society and making the mistakes as we all do as native people. And from that finding voice um, out of it with a radio program, uh, first Voices of Radio, and for the last 30 years, almost 30 years now, and being heard on 100 stations around the world, basically, on FM stations, AM, um, sometimes on podcasts, but these are radio stations, and I think that's what it is, and I end this part with, without saying too much, is that I wasn't taught to be a leader, I wasn't taught to be a follower, um, because that's not the traditional way that I've been shown and been told is that we, we were taught to be with, to walk with the earth and the people and with animals and the trees. And it's, it's, it's a lot more enjoyable this way because when you're front, you don't see anybody. And when you're following, you see, you know, you feel like you always have to be in line. So 
being being a, a walking with and the elders and this in a way that I was taught go ahead of you they go into the future and I think this is one of our premises as native people is that we listen to the elders and what better elders do we have than nature and the rocks and all those other consciousnesses so um, I think I just leave it right there um, probably left something out but I think this is good enough. Um, I live in the Catskill Mountains in New York, and um, I play the flute and instrumentals, and I like to read. Um, so I think that's one part of where I am um, involved. And I see some friends on here in the chat box and want to say hello for helping me along the way, as NACF has. And Wow, it just it's just like coming home, watching all these these uh, chats on the side here, and then just talking with Christopher and Jamaica, Lani and, and Barbara and Rubens here and Molly and all you all out there. Thank you. Um, I'll just say that much because I know we have a lot more time. Thankfully, we do, and thank you for summoning so many beautiful things. And I had to grab a pohakua stone that's um, I keep near my desk. I keep many stones near me. Stones are a really important part of my life. And as soon as you mentioned it, I thought I want to touch one right now and have it infuse its energy and its ancestry, all the people that are residing here um, into this conversation. So thank you so much, Yoko-san. Um, I am going to just pivot slightly colleagues because Tiokasen opened up something that I think is really important as he discussed this idea of leadership, which is part of the title of this discussion. Um, and it will get us to where we had planned, but I just feel really motivated by this. So um, I really appreciate something you just said, Tiokasen, which was you weren't taught to be a leader, you were taught to walk with. And I'm curious about that because this idea of um, our values are ways of working, which have shared connections, but we're also from very different communities at the same time. Um, so there might be some overlap, some shared values and differences, and yet they sometimes feel further different from some of the Western settler colonial values that we must sometimes shape shift within. And so I wonder if we could talk a little bit about what leadership means to each of you. It's a contentious word. Um, and I'm very provoked by what Tilkison opened up. And then we'll pivot back to where we were going to go in the agenda for a moment. But thanks for your flexibility. Does someone want to jump in with a little bit about what leadership might mean to you? Lonnie, please. Well, I've never really been comfortable uh, with titles. Yes. And, um, and I prefer to lead from behind and be the, uh, you know, maybe the person who gets something going, but with other people coming on board to, to work alongside me. And I, I, I think there's real value in that, um, working with other people, because when you have a person with that title, that comes with a lot of baggage and, uh, and sometimes uh, you get too much notoriety and it goes to your head, you know, and, uh, and people, it, it creates um, negative feelings with other people because our, our people were taught not to blow our own horn, you know, not to brag on ourselves. And, and so I have always recognized that I do stand on the shoulders of all those who came before me and those who are stand with me or walk with me as uh, Toixen said. And uh, so leadership, sometimes, you know, I have to lead from behind because I don't want that, I don't want that title. I don't want that uh, burden that goes with it. I just want to help, you know, I just want to, um, I can sometimes see what is needed and, and, and start working towards that goal and other people come on board to help in one way or another and we get things done that way. So my thank you so much for that. <laughs> and I love the idea of helpers. You know, there's that adage to in a crisis, look around and see who is a helper. Um, and I really appreciate that and leading from behind Jamaica, jump in. 
Yeah. Um, I, I love this question. This is something that, you know, we talk about a lot in, in the classes that I teach, especially because so much, I think as, as an educator, my work is like to help students unlearn a lot of the things that they come into the space with. And, and much of that is around this like really violent individualism that we've been fed for, at least in Hawaii, for multiple generations since the arrival of, of foreigners. Um, and that individualism plays into this particular idea of leadership that, that we've been taught, right? That leadership is a position. It comes with some kind of pala pala, like a certificate. You get it from, you know, going through formal Western training to make you qualified for that position. But everything that we learn from our mo'olelo, from our stories, tells us that um, leaders, people in positions, can be dethroned at any time. All you need to do is ask someone from Ka'u on the island of Hawaii, um, how many of their chiefs that their people rose against and, and killed because they were bad chiefs and they didn't feed the people and they were selfish and they, you know, they blew their own horn too much. Um, and when we go back and we look at these stories, we find that real leadership is not a position, it's a relationship and the people who have been able to achieve the most good and the most change and the most care for their people are the people who who paid attention to pilina to intimacy to how we are related to each other and they cared for that more than anything else um and i i think of that in relationship to what um Jerkison and lenny are both saying about you know walking with others and working with others you can only do that if you're attentive to your relations uh, if you are accountable to those relations if the process is the destination right uh the way one of the things that i think makes our peoples so powerful and and so special is that um we really pay attention to the process we really pay attention to the principles to the protocol um and all of that is about relation um and we i think we we honor and we love those who are the most attentive to that. And so the collective pushes them to be leaders, but um, that's a, that's a collective act. Tiokasen, you provoked all of this. <laughs> Is there anything further okay. you'd like to add? No, I'm grateful. Well, no apologies. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, no. Oyate uh, tokai wichake essentially means, um, that I put everything else in front of me, everybody, all life in front of me, and this is what I have to work with or be with. And it's like incredible possibility that's all in front of you. And the reason why we say this from what I'm told is that, you know, one of our ancestors, Black Elk, said that the center of the universe is everywhere. So it's all around you and who's above and below and behind and in front to really doesn't matter as long as it's everywhere and this is how much um, we have and and I think the way I've been forced to think colonially is that this this education I had to be careful that that uh, that education didn't uh, well the wisdom wasn't educated out of myself you see because then if it became everything became information and knowledge without experience and now we all bring experience with our elders, with our, those peoples who have gone into the future. Um, but we bring with that the earth. And I think that's the, separate, the separation that's being caused right now with why we are distancing earth, or social distancing, or speaking the language of distancing and not relationship. So we're distancing technically and we become human doings rather than the human beings that we are actually. And um, I think that by accomplishing things in a Western way, um, then we're forgetting about this other value that's our backbone as Native people, that it's, we pay attention to the earth first and we bring her, invite her in, in everything we do, because that's what we're made up of. So this is why we walk with, because we do anyway, the fire, the water, the earth, the, the wind, we walk with that intelligence, that great consciousness all the time anyway so do, why do we only refer to i me my mine and ours which in the old lakota never existed 
and as Lonnie and Jamaica said, there's no, there's no I, uh, because you become a noun rather than verb. So you separate yourself by speaking nouns and subjective, subject, subjecting ourselves, objectifying everything. And we forget about the motion of life. This is why we are human beings. And, and then now we can move on because this is what earth is doing anyway. And to be in rhythm with the earth means that we walk with the earth and not lead the earth or not follow the earth, but we walk with the earth to be in rhythm, to be in consciousness, consciousness with her. Yeah. This is such a great discussion. I'm really enjoying it. And as I connect back to the question that we had before, I'm realizing, you know, it does have a lot to do with unlearning. So for the webinar folks, a question that I had prepped um, our panelists to start to discuss next as a deeper way to get into who they are, what they do, where they're from, is I wanted to think about moments of awareness of the power of politics um, as an artist activist, to think back to critical moments of their own awareness. And that is a kind of unlearning in some ways. You know, many of our cultures don't have words for art that they do in Western languages. Um, it is a way of being, as you said, Tiokas, and it gets us into the verb. Um, and so I think a lot about this unlearning and I'm realizing for myself, some of my own awareness of the power of the art as politic is an unlearning um, that I had to do from some Western colonization. So just an additional frame on this, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how ways that you became aware of the power of politics in your, I'm going to use the Western word art, but in your work, in your life. Um, Jamaica, I see a lot of nodding. Do you want to jump in first? I'm going to voluntold you. <laughs> um, for sure. So I've been, I've been thinking about this a lot. I'm going to sh share my screen because I might uh, refer back to some of these these kumu, these sources of inspiration, these teachers of mine. I'm just going to leave this screen up for a minute uh, and I'll address them in a second. Um, we were talking about this in my, my class yesterday. If you look up the word art in the Hawaiian dictionary, one of the phrases that will come back to you is hana no eo. And I, I love that that is how we've decided to, to define art in our own practice because hana no eo doesn't doesn't mean to, I mean, it doesn't mean art. It means the the act of creating and working with wisdom. Um, and it is a practice that is, it's, it's an act of practicing what has been passed down for generations and generations. And I think that really orients um, our people to understanding the power of creativity uh, and the necessity of creativity to both uh, respond to wisdom, to hold wisdom, to protect wisdom. Um, this is something that I've learned from these four people, um, and especially in, in relationships, in relationship to activism and politics. Um, on the far left, we have Kumu uh, and Auntie Haunani K. Trask, uh, my father in the middle, um, just below him, his dear friend and comrade Kanalu Young, and uh, in the back on the right is um, Lili Kalakame Lehiva. Uh, and these four people, I, I consider my kumu for, for a lot of reasons. Of course, my father is my kumu. He is my, he is my source of knowledge and inspiration. But these four brilliant activist, scholar, artists expertly wove what it meant to be a kanaka, uh, what it meant to be a Hawaiian, what it meant to be a creator, what it meant to be an educator, and what it meant to serve your people. Um, and and so when I when I think about you know when I when I think about early memories of, of making these connections like what I wanted to do when I grew up what I saw as the relationship between art and activism and and education um, I just saw these four people kind of weaving that expertly as if it was always meant to be this way as if these things were never separate um, you folks may be familiar with some of these folks Kumu Nani unfortunately passed away just this past year, July 3rd, 2021. Uncle Kanalu Young passed away, I believe in 20, uh, 2008. Um, but they were, they were the founders of the Hawaiian Studies Department at my university. Uh, they were some of the most outspoken um, activist scholars in our movements in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Um, 
and and they showed me every day that politics are creative um that to be hawaiian is creative to share our stories is is political um and i i think they also showed us in particular i think kumohonani um i think kumohonani showed us in particular that our role whether we call ourselves leaders whether others call us call us leaders our our role as the artist is to say things say the things that need to be said uh, even when folks aren't ready to hear it and to not wait for for our society and our community to be welcoming to to the things that need to be said but to really kind of push that envelope um, a really good example of this of course is is Kumu Haunani saying in 1993 this prolific speech she gave in front of 10,000 Hawaiians on the anniversary of our overthrow she says uh, we are not American. We are not American. We are not American. We will die as Hawaiians. We will never be Americans. Say it in your heart. Say it in your sleep. Um, and we look back on that with such reverence, right? We see the strength of her words. Uh, we see the power of her voice and her storytelling as she connected our struggle to that of the struggle of other Native people across Turtle Island, but also of, of oppressed and occupied people across the world. Um, and we look back on that with such reverence and aloha, but in that moment, uh, those words were not uniformly celebrated. Um, they were things that brought all kinds of violence and trauma to her as a powerful poet, speaker, storyteller. Um, and so those really early memories um, that really early environment that I was lucky to grow up in just by virtue of my father being the student of these two brilliant wahine um, and the, you know, the comrade of this brilliant Kane Panalu um, really allowed me to see that what we do here, you know, the, the artists we're, we're talking with today, um, amongst today, is not, it may feel exceptional in this time, right? of disconnection and of trauma and past generations of forgetting. But what we're doing is not new. Um, we are just, you know, returning to to the work of wisdom, uh, that hana no eo, and that will require us to reach into every sphere of our lives and, and reconnect that work together. So um, yeah, I just I wanted to I wanted to share their picture today and and say their names and and honor them as a as a haumana of them and and also to acknowledge that pretty much any person who's ever studied Hawaiian studies um, at at the university and even beyond the university is a is a student of these of of these kumu um, and I just feel really lucky to be not only in relation to them but in relation to everyone who studied from them so I'll leave it there. You'll see Jamaica, there's a lot of um, love in the chat about the folks that you surfaced. And again, I have felt their mana, their life force, their presence, their power as soon as that photo came up. So thank you for surfacing those folks. And I think some of the love in the chat is really also across communities, across different nations, tribal nations, people feel the resonance of the lineages that you're surfacing. Lani, um, I saw you writing some notes and thinking and uh, and contemplating. I wonder if you want to dive into this conversation about political awareness, but also Jamaica surfaced lineage of many kinds. Do you have some thoughts to share with us? Well, when I first became politically aware, I was a junior in high school and it was, it was way back, but uh, remember when uh, the American Indian movement took over the BIA office, it was back in the early seventies and uh, and the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act had just been passed. And uh, so uh, you know, Natives were in the news and uh, things were happening. And I didn't really, uh, I wasn't really aware until then. And then um, I had taken this seminar class and my, my teacher handed me that book, uh, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, which I read and, uh, it really opened my eyes to a, a lot of things between the uh, Native American uh, and government relationship. And so I wrote a paper, which I um, 
dealt with the relationship between um, Native Americans and the federal government in, um, you know, just a junior in high school. So I'm not sure it was that very meaty, but uh, I shared that in, in my seminar class, my American history class and my English class. And I, I kind of uh, stirred up my classmates. And I remember one of them said to me, why can't you natives just be like everybody else? And, and my response was, well, why, you know, as a kid, why can't everybody else be like natives? And uh, that started me. And uh, I uh, have pushed to embrace my culture more fully every day since then. And uh, have, you know, that has kind of uh, been my motivating force. And I, I worked to, uh, in, in my village to uh, revitalize the culture on so many different levels and uh, started with the Klaquan healing robe and building of our traditional knowledge camp and uh, teaching native uh, uh, culture and Tlingit language at our school and all these things to, uh, to heal the wounds of colonization. I think because uh, you can never truly be happy and whole until you embrace who you are as a native person. And, you know, it's been beaten out of so many people. And I think that, you know, as that's grassroots. And I think, you know, seeing that picture of the person of those, that group of people who work to educate in, at the um, Hawaiian schools and that's, the same story in Alaska too. And, and it's not just me, there are other, you know, elders that I relied on and people who followed me and have worked in the language too. So it, it does, it, you know, that's what started me. We started a dance group from a traditional song leader too, and uh, had to learn from cassette tapes and uh, did, was, didn't have a firm grip with the language and still don't, I don't, you know, I'm not fluent in our language, but I did the best I could with what I had and um, just put myself out there and uh, had, you know, comrades, uh, my, my friend, Kath Hotch, you know, it's always so necessary to have at least one person who will say, I'll do this with you. You know, I'll, I'll count me and I'll be on board and, there's always been somebody to help, you know, in that way and give you courage, you know. And uh, we started the dance group and, oh, you know, I thought some elder would come up and, you know, do the singing and drumming for us. You know, we wouldn't have to use cassettes when we actually performed. One of the elders would do it. But no, we had to bite the bullet and do it ourselves. And oh, it was frightening, but uh, we did it. And, you know, we we gave each other courage and um, it's really taken off from there. And then of course, once we were singing and dance, you know, dancing, we had to have regalia. So we had to make our own regalia. And when I look back at some of the first things I made, I just think, oh, that's pathetic. But, um, you know, it grew out of that, um, out of the, the need, the need to embrace our culture and be proud of who we are. That, that has been the driving, my motivating force behind me. I don't think it sounds pathetic. I think it sounds powerful and inspiring, but I'm sure your craftsmanship my work, really upped. <laughs> my first works were pathetic is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. It's so fascinating to continue to learn about other tribal nations and cultures in my own journey and see some of these similarities of sort of reclamation and, and cultural renaissance and language revitalization that needs to happen and has happened and how it parallels and is really part of a political awakening. Um, Tioka san, I'd love to hear some thoughts from you. All right. Um, it's like, don't give a microphone to a Lakota because he can talk forever. So, all right. But we want to hear do, you. <laughs> I'll, do, I'll, I'll do my best here. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think there's a lot to do with um, when my political awareness came when I was uh, six. Um, these government 
public health service people came to our little houses and um, said that we have to take certain pills because there was uh, nuclear fallout everywhere. And the salt pills laced with uh, iodine, I think it was. So we took these for a year and I took them later on in, um, in my life. And because, you know, this was what's happening, the Nevada test site, um, they blew up over 999 atomic bombs. And a lot of that fallout with the trade winds fell in Western South Dakota. And so with that, I learned that was my first political move or nature. And I wanted to know why I was being forced to speak a different language that was very foreign to me. And a lot of it didn't make, I would say, spiritual logical sense. Um, it felt like I was, I had a headache after I, I spoke this, this language and learned the, 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 the innuendos and also the alphabet and very linear thought process. And so, you know, these things I, I've wondered and have, have helped me speak this language and put together concepts. And as you know, the etymology of our languages, the etymology of our culture has, has always been with the earth. And, and when I think about, wow, the etymology of, of this language we're speaking now is also has definition, but it's kind of lost its meaning. So when I brought it home to my mother, um, you know, she said that, you, you know, you cannot speak Lakota without intuition. So I'm like, wow, without intuition. And then, you know, and then the next moment, because, you know, I went to Evergreen State College and I had a daughter, I have a daughter, she's older now, but at that time, uh, she was four. And it was all about the Mother Earth talk here and Mother Earth talk there. And so she asked me in her language, she said, she said Ate, um, Ate, if Mother Earth is our mother, who's Mother Earth's mother? And I'm like, whoa, you know, four-year-olds talking like this. I call my mother appropriately. And she said, she said, she said um, Masula, which in, in a physical sense means that your head, your brain is merely a seed of the heart. So that got me to thinking that, wow, these, starts, these, these thoughts come from the heart, not just the concepts that are taught to us above the head and then you accumulate data and knowledge, no experience. And so this is what, you know, I, my political nature is, is usually I say things um, uh, often, I often say things that the colonizer doesn't accept. And I think that's the way of being who we are as, as native people, because the consciousness of the earth, uh, standing rock and wounded knee when I was very young happened um, with uh, Western Shoshone, all those uh, action, actions that, that were, I was been involved with the very little things as ma mass, bigger things, I guess you would say, but equal things as mascots and where you're at. You see, I'm not on a reservation. I'm not among my people, yet I am because I'm seeing, wow, the migratory or, or basically are transmitting who we are as Native people all over this land for a long, a long time is what really brings one into focus that we are not, we may be landless, right? You've heard this before. We may be landless, but we're not homeless. And this is what I want to do is like, you know, I've traveled everywhere around the world, as I said earlier, and indigenous peoples all over the world. And the difference is the political nature that has changed the native person is that we begin to believe that they, in their domination thought process. And as I went throughout indigenous peoples from the world, I began to ask the question that I found out in this place, in Auschwitz in 2011, with an elder, Virgil Kilstraight, and we had a ceremony in the middle of Birkenau, this uh, death camp, and I asked him, I said, uncle, do we, do we have a, a, a word for domination? He said, no word for domination, no concept for domination. Everything has to be in relationship. So this is, you know, compelled me to think about even more. So I asked the question of other indigenous peoples worldwide, and it comes that they do not have a true meaning for domination. 
<clears throat> that it has to be all in relationship. So our, our languages are in relationship or relative to everything, you see? And if we rationalize and individualize, then we, we accept leadership and followership and then we, we, we just kind of reiterate or we relinquish um, our, our relationship and go into the individualism of rationalization. And this is how we get, a, get ahead and survive in a society that has forgotten how to live with the earth. So this political nature that has been at that time since I've been young to now older, it's like, wow, this, this is with our people. You go places, you can go to the UN with working with the UN and United Nations and working with you know other governments and that that's political in their nature. But the last to be talked about has always been Earth. They don't talk about the earth. They talk about cost effective. Um, I've been to the, the COP 25, um, six, seven, eight of them all over the world. And in, I remember this one time in 1991, Rio de Janeiro, um, it was about the earth summit and native people weren't even involved. They were invited, but they were invited to have their own little summit 50 miles from Rio de Janeiro in the jungle. And I thought about this and the re reason why I started First Voices Indigenous Radio at that time um, is actually called Exposing the Apologetic Predator because, you know, words in, in radio can be an art form too, and how you bring it, present, present it to the people as the message is much bigger than who you are as an individual. And so when I brought the words of Marcus Terena, who was given five minutes at the end of that two-week summit, that those words that he said, because they were allowed five minutes, stunned the world because he held them for, for, for over 30 minutes to speak the truth of the earth. And because all the indigenous peoples had gotten together and said the messages of earth well, the rest of the economy, of the Earth's economy, uh, peoples of nations have only talked from the economics of it. How much can you have? How much are we polluting? Everything was being measured and, and weighed. And no one was talking about that relationship. And so that political name may be a little bit different because it's more related to spirit than you've heard. Politics are the highest form of uh, spiritual intelligence. And this is where, where we have, have come from, that we always have Earth coming and telling us, and we ask her first, is this what I did in order to maybe speak from the heart even more so? And not just present myself, but present my experience of going through this world. Um, and now I see this consciousness. It has always been there. We just forgot how to pay attention to it because the language is taking us away from focusing with earth and individually how do we how do we exist and get ahead in a society that doesn't recognize that consciousness that we have carried from our ancient peoples for, for, I love forever. This, Jokasun, because um it really gets to the heart of the title of this which i think is you know a, a settler mindset of native artists as leaders but then in those types of environments as you're saying if that voice isn't present, if a native and indigenous voice isn't present, or if it's segregated 50 miles away from the other conversations, then real effective and powerful change is harder to come by. And this is where I think our roles as leaders has potential, as problematic and as colonial as that word is. And I was thinking, wow, we could re-indigenize this this panel and call it native artists in relation, native artists as helpers. You know, there's so many other ways that we could approach this. And yet in a certain perspective, this gets some, into some really difficult identity politics in certain ways as we progress and fight for and advocate for our communities. Sometimes adopting this Western word is potent, powerful and educating folks beyond that concept of what this, colonized uh, colonial settler word is 
Um, we're going to dig deeper into that in just a moment, but um, all of you folks attending the webinar, thank you for participating with us. Thank you for your chat. Again, I saw some folks came late. We're so grateful that you could join us here with the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation and these incredible panelists in this really meaningful discussion. Um, my colleague, Laura, is going to launch a poll, um, and this is just for us to anonymous, anonymously get to know who's on the call today, who's tuning in. It's really helpful for us, just as we think about future programming like this. And as um, my colleague Barbara said at the beginning, we are at a critical point at the Native Arts and Cultures Foundation where we will now also be place-based. We have this beautiful Center for Native Arts and Cultures that um, is, just incredible. And so as we think about all of the different types of ways we serve artists and communities, we'd love for you to fill this out. So you might have seen it pop up on your screen. If you haven't um, yet, it's there. Click around, click through those quick questions. It'll be really helpful. And again, it's anonymous. It's just for us to get to know who's in the room and help us think about future programming. We're also going to take this moment to take a deep breath, the ha breath. This is um, wonderful, but also intense conversation with these great panelists and all of the folks that they also bring into the Zoom room with them. So wherever you are, whatever land you're on, take a deep breath. Ugh. All right. Hopefully you've had a chance to start digging into that poll. Thank you for participating. Um, so we're gonna go back into the conversation and panelists, this has been so juicy as you saw from the chat, I'm adapting slightly um, to recognize our biggest colonizer, time. Um, time is always colonizing my life. <laughs> so I'd love to dig into, it's definitely been referenced already, but you know, um, things with, re-indigenizing, reconnecting with language, culture that was lost, um, land, landlessness, Mauna Kea, um, these really critical issues. And so I wonder if each of you could speak a little bit about some critical issues that you see in your very particular communities that you're connected to and are part of, and also work that you're involved in. I used the word work, your work in the question, that's such a misnomer, work that you're involved in and connected to and supporting that addresses these issues. Um, yeah, so let's dive into that. Um, Lonnie, do you feel prepared to jump in there? <laughs> sure. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest issues that we're facing here in Klukwan is the um, Constantine Mine development, which is upriver of Klukwan, and it's in our watershed. And uh, we're concerned that this mine development will destroy the salmon habitat and destroy our way of life essentially because we depend on the salmon. And so um, as an artist, you know, it gives you a certain platform like, you know, today I'm participating in this webinar, um, but recently I uh, was interviewed for a PBS special and uh, just different things like that. Uh, there was a, a film, Rock, Paper, Fish. And I'm not saying this to blow my own horn, but uh, I've tried to use the platform as an artist to get the word out that this Chilkat Valley merits protection. You know, it's a treasure to us. It's a treasure to um, the people who live in this region because it, it hosts five, all five species of Pacific salmon. And um, it's hosts the largest gathering of uh, bald eagles in the world. And um, yeah, so, and, that, and that's our home and our ancestors are buried here. We have no other home. And so um, using my artwork like this, this weaving I'm wearing, the Chilkat uh, River Collar, I guess, um, helps to educate people who aren't aware of the Chilkat River and its values and uh, its value to the world. Um, you know, because people all over the world will, will eat 
Pacific salmon. And where, where would they get it if we destroy all the habitat for the salmon? I mean, uh, there's a, a company in Japan, the Dawa company, who's funding this mine. And would they do that in their own backyard? Would they kill the, the food that their people eat? I don't think so. So we need to educate people um, far and wide that we can't keep doing that. I heard somebody in a, in a podcast say this, and I really liked it. When you, do, uh, when you do violence to the earth, you do violence to yourself. And it's so true because we can't, we have to respect and we have to, um, as, as uh, Anyat Kusanis, as noble people of the earth, we do have a responsibility to protect the earth and to nurture it. And, uh, you know, to realize that that's our life, that um, we have, we depend on that. You know, whether you live in a, a little house along the Chilkat River or a, a skyscraper in Manhattan, we're all people of the earth. We all depend on the earth for our sustenance in so many different ways. And so we need to take care of it. So I use my artwork as a platform. I also use um, the, the opportunities that, that comes my way to, to get that story out. That's so helpful. And, and thank you for connecting at the end there with this idea of using the opportunities to get the story out, which I think is one of the ways that our Native voices, our Native leadership, air quotes around that, out in other contexts is so important and valuable. Mahalo for the work you do, Lani. Thank you. Jamaica. Yeah, um, I'm going to follow uh, Lani's lead and, and use this opportunity to get the word out on, on an issue that we're facing right now in this moment. I'm going to drop a few links or stuff in the chat. Um, the, the biggest crisis facing Native Hawaiians um, and the Pacific and probably the world is militarization. Um, this is coming to a head in a lot of ways. In Hawaii, we have a number of expiring military leases leases is a really like strong word for like they just stole land and then wrote up some paperwork um you know the military wants to condemn these lands so they continue to use them uh these include places like pohaku loa which is on mount awakea which we spent we've as our people have been spending the last number of years trying to protect uh places like makua on my island uh but right now right now the US Navy has finally admitted to poisoning our um, main water source on Oahu, on the island that I live on. Uh, they've admitted, or we've found out that they've been lying, that they've known about the fact that the water has been contaminated for months. Um, our state has stepped up, kind of, and demanded that the US Navy drain the tanks and move the fuel. The Navy has just responded saying, we're gonna fight that in court. Um, even though they're actively poisoning our water. And so um, this, in this moment, is the most critical issue we're facing in Hawaii. Um, because, you know, as everyone on this call knows, right, water is life, ola kawaii. Um, without it, we have just, just like if without land, we have nothing. Without this water, we will not survive. Um, and the Navy is doing irreparable damage uh, to this water source. So if folks want to learn more, there are two links in the chat. There are also a couple um, Instagram and Twitter handles where you can kind of follow along, especially for those of you in Hawaii or who are Hawaiian, even if you're not in Hawaii anymore. Um, we need to generate critical mass and pressure and honestly make a PR nightmare uh, for the US Navy. Uh, the conversation has mostly been contained to local media, but it's slowly getting out into national media. So that's another way that some of our uh, comrades from Turtle Island could support and just talking about this and talking about it in relationship to the to the same issues that you're facing and extractive mining in your own communities and militarization and uh, history of effects of nuclear fallout in your own community. I mean, all of this is connected and and to me, this is connected to a larger issue of, you know, we are all living in a crisis of intimacy and a crisis of disconnection. Um, disconnection enables violence. 
and I don't just mean we, us indigenous people on this call, but I mean all of us in the same way that all of us are, are children of this earth. Um, you know, Lani said really beautifully, like when you do violence on the land, you do violence on, upon yourself. And I believe we can only do violence against the land and each other if we feel disconnected from each other and the land. Uh, we allow our lands to be poisoned, our water to be poisoned. We allow our kin to be caged or shot down in the street by police. We allow lands to be extracted from, from for capital. And all of that is only enabled by disconnection. Um, and so I really believe for even in all of our differences and, and the distinctness of our histories, um, one of the things that binds us together in my mind is a need to abolish these systems that foster and create disconnection on our route to you know, continuing to practice that hana no eau, that, that wisdom that will build this better, more livable future in the image of our ancestors and of our elders. Um, so yeah, tell your friends about Red Hill. That's specifically where the, the water is being poisoned. Um, and, and mahalo already to all of, the, all of our comrades from Turtle Island who've been supporting us in this work. Um, it's, it's really dire right now. Um, so mahalo. Mahalo for lifting that up. Um, Tioka-san, tell us about some things going on in your community and how it connects to you oh. and your work. All right, I'll go quickly here. I think one of our major sources that they consider resources are children and being, being an experiencer of abduction. As you say, as people would say that the mind of extraction starts somewhere and it's because people who lack and they think in lack of, they need this and they need that. And I go back to the etymology of the earth where, you know, make sure that you're speaking that language that doesn't lie from the earth. The earth doesn't lie. So what deceptions are we using the colonial language of duality? And I, I say these things because I've been doing radio for 30 years now. And I, that's just my university everywhere. All lives, all continents of indigenous peoples and in being interviewed and in interviewing people um, and just kind of exchanging these ideas, these energies, oral history through, through radio, through technology in a sense. But, you know, finding out what, you know, what Lonnie was referring to more or less a, an obligation that we have rather than the right to anything. It's an obligation or responsibility to, to understand why we are here and what we're doing here, and again, I refer to an uncle that we all used to know. In fact, today is is passing several so six years ago, and he said, you know, learning to live with the earth, basically, um, having peace with the earth rather than peace on the earth. Because if you look at one, is domination; the other is in relationship. So I go with that and think about you know the the advocacy work that I do with with children and community. Um, 13 years ago, we brought forth to um, others who really cared from their hearts, human beings who came, and we stopped suicide on my reservation in this one little town. And now we've, we've they're building, we built buffer houses in order to stop the tracking or taking away of our children, and they're being fostered out and adopted out. And all, and we we reintroduced native foods to them. And that's how we learn, we learn our languages through the foods, the spiritual foods. Um, the advocacy of the earth is always there and we teach that and show that. Um, the mi missing and murdered indigenous women. There's so many issues that we could be involved with. Um, and that right now I'm working with many people about the grave sites that are being revealed all over Turtle Island and in Canada, um, 139 residential schools, boarding schools and nearly 400 that have barely been scratched here in, in the United States, you know? So this is, and you know, I, I can't take, talk numbers, but interviewing the person who, who does this, who is, who is uh, from that area in Canada, who is a scientist and she runs her, her uh, radar sound machine to, and it takes half an acre a day. And she has all these, this list of grave, places, sites to go through throughout Canada, and how much that costs a day just to reveal what's underneath the earth that they totally want to forget about us, 
So it's, it's this consciousness that they were buried with these children is now coming back now. So you see the strength in this metaphysical way that, that I feel, right? And so to me, the radio has always been an active political and a way to engage in community. Physically, um, here is, I have no agenda meetings with Native and non-Native people. No agenda. We allow the the the, the fire without end to, to tell us what is to come and what we have to do now as human beings. So with that, I'll keep that short. And, you know, to me, it's extractive thinking. Are we extractively taking from others to shore up our survivability? Or are we asking the earth because that's who we, you know, we, we, all of us as Native people, we ask the earth first before we do anything. And if that's wisdom or if that's experience, well, this is mantra. This is mantra because mm. that's what we need to do now. So thank you, Christopher. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all so much. The wisdom, the community, the relations that have been shared here, I'm so grateful for. As I reflect on those last comments, you know, it's both powerful and in some ways not surprising the themes of the of the strong issues land water our natural environment our food sources whether they be animal or plant our ancestors um, in hawaiian we say our evi the bones um, you mentioned some you know really challenging things that we've been exposed to in the past couple of years that we knew were there in terms of Indian schools and other bones being revealed and repatriation, rematriation of bones that have been stolen and are in museums around the globe. These issues keep coming up. And of course, the reconnection, revitalization, re-energizing, re-indigenizing of our language and culture. Um, you wonderful humans, I'm so grateful to have had this space with you. Um, I'm big fans of all of your work. Um, I only know one of you really from being in person, but I look forward to more opportunities for that. To my colleagues at Native Arts and Cultures Foundation and all of our funders, thank you. For all of you tuning in, please um, fill out the anonymous survey. We want to really want to make sure that we continue to design, create, and offer programming that's meaningful and interesting to you and supports your work, because I know there are a lot of great people in the chat and on the webinar that are doing excellent work and service in relation to their communities. Again, my name is Christopher. I'm part of the NACF staff and really, really grateful to all of you. Mahalo nui loa for tuning in and deep, deep mahalo to our panelists, Lani, Jamaica, and Tiokasan. Mahalo. Oh, these gorgeous languages. Oh, there's our CEO and president, Lulani. Mahalo for being with us. Aloha. Ma. <laughs>